Hello, I'm Roger Sutton. I'm Chief Executive of CERA. We've now come to the end of the land zoning decisions we started making in 2011. Those early decisions were about the flat land. These videos today are about the final decisions we've made regarding the Port Hills. We've put together a series of videos with Dr Keith Turner. Keith Turner was the person who's led the review panel's work and he's going to talk about the review panel's recommendations that have been used in making these Port Hills decisions. For some people, these videos won't be enough, they'll want more information. And to answer those questions, we're organising a, session, um, a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, public meetings, where we can come along and get more detailed information about particular issues affecting their area. I know this has been a very lengthy process and it's been very, very stressful for a lot of people. But we wanted to make these decisions um, correctly. We wanted to consider all the information people gave us. We wanted to consider all the information all the geotech experts had been through. We've taken every care we can to try and make sure these decisions are correct and these decisions will therefore give people confidence to carry on living in their houses or if necessary to decide to take up our red zone offer. If you have any further questions, having seen this video or reading your information packs, you can ring us at 0800 ring Sarah or send us an email at info at sarah.govt.nz. My name's Keith Turner and I'd like to explain for you a little bit about what the Port Hills Review Panel uh, have gone through in reviewing the red zoning in that area. Right from the outset, we knew we were tackling a very important task. A task where we had been given criteria by the government and we had to apply them consistently, practically, carefully, and to be reasonable in our judgments. We knew we were making decisions about people's lives about people's homes and the places that they have deep feelings for. I can personally understand how deep some people's feelings may be. I have built my own home and lived in it for 32 years and had very strong emotions for that property. However, I just can't imagine the reaction that many of you must have had to the earthquake and the red zoning. So we took a great deal of care, knowing the responsibilities that had been placed upon us. <clears throat> when we went about this task, we considered each properly, property very carefully. It was very important for me that the whole panel understood not just the technical issues with each property, but actually understood what they looked like and where they were. So the way we tackled the job was to go out and on the first day of a week-long ex exercise, we spent looking around all of the areas that we were going to consider. Following that field visit, we spent three or four days in the office going through masses of data, and we had a lot of data available to us. We had modelling results from GNS called 2D modelling. We had some additional 3D modelling information. We had a lot of ground mapping. We had a lot of crack mapping that was available to us. We had a whole host of GNS reports that were absolutely extensive. I think they would, have, if they'd been piled up, they'd have been at least a foot thick. We had four specialist engineers in the room while we did these considerations. A specialist engineer from GNS, deeply involved in the modelling. We had an engineer from the City Council who had been involved in the Section 124 work. We had a CIRA expert and we also had a, an additional uh, consultant advising CIRA. On top of all of that, we also had cliff collapse modelling and we had the ground truthing that had been undertaken by field crews who had gone out into the field to correlate what the the modelling had said with actual field conditions. 
So we had a great deal of data, far more than we can present to you in the, the results of this review. At the end of our work, after a week of considering the uh, technical material and having made our preliminary decisions, we went back out into the field and spent nearly a day verifying on the ground many of the decisions that we had made in the office. So it was an extensive exercise. What I can also say to you is in going through the technical data, you cannot just uplift the, the, the modeling, particularly the 2D modeling, and take it on its face value. You do have to interpret it, you have to understand how it has been done. In many places, we found the modeling either underestimated or overestimated the risk, particularly because in the way the modeling works, it does tend to average across an area. And when you look at the ground and look at the profile of rock roll, uh, even modeled, uh, sorry, even actual rock trajectories, it doesn't always match up with the modeling. Modeling's also a bit inaccurate at the extremities. Uh, numerical systems don't always work well when there's significant changes. And at the ends of each of the modeling areas, there's a lot of need for interpretation. The same can be said about cliff collapse. The cliff collapse modeling gives an idea of where the cliffs might uh, project out to, but in many cases, field observation showed material going further than the model represented. And, and also, in many places, the cliff collapse model did not pick up, pick up the profile of the land as accurately as it needed to. So we had to interpret uh, around cliff collapse as well. Finally, I want to say a little bit about the driving criteria. The cabinet had approved our work to be done on the basis of immediate risk to life. And they quantified that risk as immediate risk to life of one in 10,000 chances in 2016. It was done for 2016 to get past the, all of the earthquake settling, all of the myriad of small earthquakes that are settling down after this big one. And what does it really mean? What does one in 10,000 risk to life really mean? Well, there are three major uncertainties. One is, what's the chance of an event, another big earthquake happening? Secondly, if you do have another big earthquake, what's the chance of boulders rolling down the hill, being released from a source up the top of the hill and rolling down the hill? And thirdly, what's the chance the boulder will hit a person? And I guess it's that last point that's most important. And the way in which the risk was defined was to assume that in any spot where the risk model was run, there may be a person present for something like 16 hours a day. So that might apply to a dwelling. Uh, and that's absolutely fundamental to the way in which we looked at risk. So I hope you can understand a little bit about the complexity of what we had to do. And we did our very best to recognise immediate risk to life and, and to confirm and add to the zoning decisions that we started with. We're looking at map 23 called Sumner Vale. And we've got two areas uh, of interest here in uh, the area of Sumner Vale Drive, Evans Pass Road, and also Lamar Lane and Ocean View Road. Sorry, Ocean View Terrace. So in the area of Sumner Vale Drive, this area here, uh, exposed to rock roll risk, uh, we have blue lines showing the risk profile. But in this particular area here, uh, this is an area where boulders crossed Evans Pass Road, uh, penetrated uh, property, and uh, quite a number of boulders were mapped in this area well beyond 
the risk line as shown uh, here. So we had quite a bit of expert review undertaken on this area and we were convinced uh, after receiving expert advice that the risk line does understate the risk in this particular area. Um, further along to the, uh, to the northeast in the Lamar Lane area, uh, again quite a lot of boulder mapping from rock sources above um, the uh, risk profile and the mapping and the risk profile uh, matched fairly well. Uh, so we were confident on the risk profile in the sort of Ocean View Terrace Lamar Lane area, but were convinced both by 3D mapping and also uh, expert advice that the risk was understated in this uh, Sumner Vale Drive Evans Pass area. So that's map 23, Sumner Vale. We're looking at map 24 and it's named Hebbardon number one. And it really covers the, the center area of Hebbardon Avenue. There's quite a lot going on in this map. Um, firstly, the blue area outlines the rock roll risk in this area. Uh, quite strong sources of boulders uh, along the, uh, the southeastern side. Um, but interspersed amongst that same uh, boulder roll risk, a uh, number of sea cut cliffs that uh, have their retreat lines and also inundation uh, protection areas. So they are sitting uh, within the rock roll area and hence considerable uh, risk to life within this area. Uh, two characteristics of this area though is that the the topography is bowl-shaped uh, around about um, Truro Street type area and also at the um, uh, Arnold Street end of Hebbardon. So uh, in this Arnold Street area, the uh, risk profile uh, penetrates across the road. We did look carefully at the potential for Hebbardon Avenue to form a bench and to protect uh, properties across the road. But because of that topography in this area, uh, we concluded that uh, the risk profile was across the road and we should recognise that. And likewise back here at Truro Street, um, this area here was also, we considered to be uh, affected. Um, further to the, to the northeast, uh, we have a number of uh, cliffs. These are both a combination of sea cut cliff and that have been quite heavily modified. So the the modifications in here have tended to stabilise these cliffs. What was apparent from the the detailed logging of the area is that there was no evidence of uh, cracking or dislodgement from the cliff faces. This whole area remained uh, remarkably stable in comparison to adjacent. Uh, Cliff, uh, cliff, uh, sea cut cliffs only. So we did not consider this risk to be um, uh, particularly great given how stable the, uh, the land had been. Um, <clears throat> subsequent to our recommendations, we understand that Cabinet has decided that a small portion of the Van Ash School area, just a small corner, uh, should be zoned red and it relates to this focus or bowl-shaped area, the topography, giving rise to boulders potentially getting across the road. In fact, one boulder did penetrate across the road and ended up in the middle of a field here. So uh, that's a subsequent decision to the recommendations of the panel. So that's map 24, Hebbardon number one. We're looking at map 25 called Hebbardon number two. And this is the area to the northeastern end of Hebbardon Avenue. Just at the left hand side of the map, uh, these uh, cliff areas uh, are of interest. The um, one near my hand right now, that cliff is a natural sea cut cliff. There's no 
uh, no modification to it. Uh, quite a lot of evidence of uh, damage in this area. So the panel was satisfied that the risk profile from cliff collapse and immediate risk to life was, uh, was correct and that the zonings that uh, were observable there were absolutely appropriate. Just a little to the northeast, this small area of cliff here, uh, the, the modelling here has showing this as a cliff, but in actual fact, the land is steep, but not uh, vertical. So this is a modelling anomaly where, uh, because it's steeply sloping land, uh, would not normally be um, considered to be a risk. Uh, further to the northeast, the uh, cliff establishes again, runs right out to the coast. Uh, and again, we've got a relatively wide uh, risk zone for cliff collapse uh, inundation. The, many people in this area will know that the cliff inundation propagated onto and, and boulders crossed uh, Heberton Avenue in this area. Uh, the panel spent quite some time reviewing this area to make sure that uh, the zoning decisions were, were properly made and uh, in fact uh, took a great deal of care to, uh, to ensure that nothing was uh, left untouched. So that's map 25, Heberton number 2. We're looking at map 26 called Whitewash Head and we're looking right down on Whitewash Head but on the Sea Ridge side is where we're particularly interested in the risk profile. This is an area that was extensively damaged uh, by the earthquake. This map actually captures uh, the profile of Whitewash Head prior to the earthquake. And you can see the yellow lines are an example of the extent of retreat from the collapse of the cliff face. These cliffs are some 130 metres high, and the retreat uh, observable in some cases was up to 30 metres of cliff disappearing down into the sea. Because of the height and the extent of material lost in this area, you can see that the uh, retreat lines two and three are quite large distances back, and that's very consistent with the, the detailed crack mapping that took place uh, in this area, which in some cases extends 50 to 60 metres back from the cliff face itself. Again, the panel uh, visited this area and took a great deal of detailed interest in it because of the uh, significant risks to life. Uh, it's fair to say that the uh, crack mapping provided a great deal of interest beyond the red zoning that we were aware of. We looked very carefully at this uh, southern end of the, uh, the cliff. The crack mapping did indicate that there was potential for a significant retreat even without an earthquake. Uh, but just immediately further to the south, there is a change in the topography. There's a buttress that's here. So we did not consider we needed to go beyond where the red zoning is currently now. So very serious damage, a very high risk to life, and uh, a great deal of geotechnical analysis and crack mapping to go with it. So that's map 26, whitewash head. We're looking at map 27 called Taylor's Mistake Road, uh, and in the vicinity of Smuggler's Cove. Uh, this is an area that uh, is exposed to um, uh, cliff collapse. The, uh, the cliffs are declining in height from uh, Whitewash Head, but they're also quite a different character to Whitewash Head. Uh, after the earthquakes, there was very little indication of damage in this area. Uh, some small areas of uh, cracking were logged, but uh, no... Uh, significant exposure to risk to life. So in this case, uh, there was no red zoning required. So that's Taylor's Mistake Road, Road Map 27. We're looking at Map 28 uh, called Hobson's Bay, and it takes in 
the Hobson's Bay area. There's two uh, risk uh, issues to consider here. There's this uh, blue rock roll risk area. Um, <clears throat> quite careful examination of that space. Uh, quite a diminished uh, rock source area. And so the, the panel received expert advice to su suggest that this uh, risk line uh, was slightly overstated and it doesn't have any impact on property. Um, more interesting is the cliff face along the front of Hobson's Bay. Uh, this area is sea cut cliff and uh, with immediate risk to life from inundation at the foot of the cliff affecting a number of properties along that uh, bay frontage. To the southern end of the bay um, an area that's uh, identified in yellow here looks like uh, cliff collapse but in actual fact this area is a modelling anomaly the uh, area is steeply sloping ground, it's not a cliff, and uh, there would be no inundation risk in this area. So that's map 28, Hobson's Bay. We're looking at map 29 called Taylor's Mistake Bay, and in the area of uh, what locals will know as the eastern end of Rotten Row. This area is overlapped by both rock roll risk and cliff collapse risk. Uh, the panel uh, sought expert advice on the, the combination of the two in this area and we're satisfied that the modelling does accurately represent the risk to life in this area so we were satisfied with the zonings that uh, appear. So that's map 29, Taylor's Mistake Bay. We're looking at map 30 called Boulder Bay and in this area there's uh, two sea cut cliffs, uh, significant inundation zones uh, beneath those cliffs uh, and quite clearly that inundation uh, puts, the, uh, the, puts a significant risk below those cliffs and the panel's happy that uh, red zoning should apply. So that's map 30 Boulder Bay. We're looking at map 31 called Gilmore Terrace and we're particularly interested in the Gilmore Terrace area. Now on this map there are two uh, risk profiles, the, um, the cliff collapse area that runs along the edge of the port and uh, out uh, towards the uh, Littleton Head uh, beside Sumner Road. Uh, this blue risk profile is rock roll risk but the area of only, the, the area of interest is this area around Gilmore Terrace. Uh, this rock roll risk uh, comes from a, a diminished rock source just above in that uh, area there and the panel got some expert advice to, uh, to decide whether this risk profile was uh, accurate or not and concluded that it, it slightly overstated the risk in this area. So we're happy with the, uh, the zoning decisions that arose from, uh, from that slightly overstated risk. So that's map 31, Gilmore Terrace. We're looking at map 32 called Branchley Road. And we particularly want to concentrate on the Hilton Heights area, uh, the Branchley Road area and the Crosslands terrace uh, area. In the Hilton Heights area we have uh, rock sources up in this area. Uh, quite a gully that tends to funnel the rock down into the lower part of the gully which gives rise to this rock roll risk extending down as a bit of a finger and affecting uh, this property in the same locality. Across at Brenchley Road we've got a property that lies wholly within the uh, rock roll risk zone. Uh, and down here at Crossland Terrace, again we've got a bit of a gully that is funneling or focusing rocks that are sourced up in this area down into the gully. So this property here which sits up on the shoulder of the land is largely isolated from the rock roll risk even though the risk profile appears to cut through it. 
So we think that's a bit overstated for the risk. Uh, but clearly boulders coming down the bottom of this valley do affect this property in this location. So that's map 32, Branchley Road. We're looking at uh, map 33 called Endeavour Place and in the area of Endeavour Place and Soames Road. Uh, the risk profile here is driven by rock roll. Uh, two distinct areas though, a bit of a curve, uh, a bit of a ridge line uh, in this locality. So the rock tends to shed off to either side of this ridge and our experts uh, advised us that the risk profile from the modelling is overestimated in this particular area, uh, the, the Soames Road Endeavour uh, place area. So we expect that the, the rocks coming down the valley rather than uh, over the ridge would relieve the risk in this, in this locality. So that's map 33, Endeavour place. We're looking at map 34 called Hawkehurst Road and we're interested in the upper end of Hawkehurst Road. This is an area that's exposed to rock roll risk uh, shown by the blue line. It's a horseshoe uh, rock source location. So the rock is coming in from all, of, all around the risk zone that's plotted out. And so the properties within the risk zone are the ones that are affected. That's map 34, Hawkehurst Road. We're looking at map 35 in the area of uh, Vellis and Walkers Road. Uh, this is an area that's affected by rock roll. Uh, the early work uh, undertaken by GNS did show quite extensive areas of risk, particularly in this area. But just prior to the panel beginning its work, uh, considerable revision was undertaken with, uh, with, with the modelling in this area. Uh, the modelling changed and uh, the risk profile was considerably reduced. So we have quite a complex a picture of rock roll risk, some small areas in this locality and up the top here, uh, some larger areas uh, back in this area. But the risk profile that had previously given rise to red zoning of this locality has changed and uh, this region has been rezoned to green. However, in this particular area here, uh, paid a lot of attention to just the sources of rock, the sources of rock in this area are in a sort of a horseshoe shape. Uh, there is evidence of rock roll into this property. Uh, so on the basis that rock mapping identified that despite the risk profile, some risk existed within this area and uh, the section 124 was clearly another reason for having a very close look at it. Uh, the panel did conclude that this area should remain uh, red zoned. So that's map 35, uh, Vallis Walkers Road. We're looking at map 36 called Buxton's Road uh, with a particular interest in the area of Cressy Terrace. On this map there's uh, two risk uh, sources. One is the uh, cliff running along the boundary of the port area and the inundation risk below that cliff. Uh, there's also uh, some rock roll risk uh, in this area but it is not affecting any properties. Subsequent to the review panel's recommendations some extensive detailed geotechnical investigation identified an area of cliff that's very localised that does show a significant instability and uh, subsequent to our recommendations cabinet has decided to zone 
this area red. So that's map 36, Buxton's Road. We're looking at map 37 called Naval Point. The risk uh, the panel was interested in here was uh, cliff collapse, this cliff area, this cliff zone along the, uh, the border of the port commercial area. We were satisfied that the risk profile arising from this cliff was properly represented, but the panel did not have a brief to uh, consider zoning in the port commercial area. So we did not make any zoning decisions in this uh, area at all. So that's map 37, Naval Point. We're looking at map 38 called Mariner's Cove and we're particularly interested in the area of Governor's Bay Road. Above Governor's Bay Road uh, there was a uh, considered to be a, a rock source area and it was initially modelled uh, in a very similar way to other rock sources in the uh, Littleton zone. Uh, however, subsequent to the panel's uh, convening, further field investigation and modelling was undertaken, which showed that actually the quantity of rock source and the size of the boulders that would come from that rock source were quite different to the other areas in the Littleton Basin. So some specific modelling was done for this area. It considerably reduced the zone of risk and hence the panel concluded after receiving that additional modelling that the areas that had previously been zoned red should be zoned green. So that's map 38, Mariner's Cove. We're looking at map 39 called Rapaki Bay, and we're particularly interested in the area around Governor's Bay Road. This area is driven by uh, rock roll. There are some quite large rock sources on the upper slopes in this area. And those rock sources give rise to quite large or very large boulders which will uh, roll a long way. So we, the panel uh, looked very carefully at the risk profile. Uh, it was acutely aware that actually some boulders had already come down from the earthquake and penetrated one of the dwellings. So it was satisfied that the life risk definition was fair and accurate and that the zoning to red was appropriate in this area. So that's map 39, Rapaki Bay. We're looking at map 40, uh, Governor's Bay Road and in the area of Governor's Bay Road. Uh, in this area uh, the, the risk of rock roll runs right down to the water's edge. There are some quite large boulder sources uh, in this zone area giving rise to this rock roll risk. Uh, the boulders in this area also tend to be quite large, so they do travel a long way. Uh, so the panel was quite satisfied with the zoning that was already in red. Subsequent to the panel's recommendations, Cabinet has uh, decided that it should also zone uh, this area red and the area right along the waterfront uh, also red. So that is map 40, Governors Bay Road. We're looking at uh, map 41 uh, called Maori Gardens and we're particularly interested along the Governance Bay Road area. This is an area that's got two sources of risk. The, the blue line represents uh, rock roll and uh, runs right down along the water's edge. 
The, the rock roll really comes from rock sources uh, in this area, and there's quite extensive rock sources, and the rock sources do give rise to quite large boulders. These large boulders can roll right down to the water's edge. So the panel was satisfied with the definition of the risk profile for rock roll, uh, and was satisfied with the red zoning uh, that applied within it. We also had to consider the cliff collapse area right down near the water's edge. Um, these are cliffs that have quite considerable inundation risk. And after looking carefully at, uh, at that inundation risk, uh, we did think it appropriate that the area below the cliffs be red zoned. Subsequent to the panel's recommendations, uh, Cabinet has decided to red zone the strip of land uh, running along the edge of the shore uh, to red. So that's map 41, Maori Gardens. We're looking at map 42 called Zephyr Terrace and we're particularly interested in the area around Hayes Rise and, uh, and the Zephyr Terrace. This is an area subject to rock roll risk. Uh, the blue profile outlines the uh, risk profile arising from that rock roll. Rock roll sources come from both sides, from, from this side and also from this side. Uh, in the area of Hayes Rise and, and Zephyr Terrace, there are a number of residential properties and uh, they fall well within the uh, risk to life profile and so they have been zoned red. That's map 42, Zephyr Terrace. We're looking at map 43 called Leading Light Lane. And we're particularly interested in the areas around Leading Light Lane and the terrace. This is an area that is characterised by rock roll risk. The blue line shows the risk profile for uh, the risk to life. The area has some quite large rock sources uh, up in this zone and those rock sources can give rise to quite large boulders, and the large boulders do run quite a long distance. Uh, <clears throat> we recommended zoning residential property that it was within this risk profile, but we had a very close look at this lower area, and we sought some specialist geotechnical advice about the risk profile at this bottom end of the, of the valley where it does tend to flatten out. And we were advised that the risk line was overstated in this area, so we did not recommend a red zoning of these very lower properties. That's map 43, Leading Light Lane. We're looking at map 44, showing Marine Drive. And this is on the Charteris Bay Diamond Harbour side of Littleton Harbour. This area was not uh, surveyed with LIDAR detection equipment for rock roll or cliff collapse. But experts did discover that there were some large rock outcrops directly above several properties in this area here that had been weakened and fractured by the earthquakes. In fact, some of the rocks did actually move and roll down uh, through the properties. So as a result, the panel, uh, while not having a specific modelled risk to life here, did consider that the risk to life was sufficient to warrant recommending red zoning of these properties. So that's map 44, Marine Drive. 